As uh, Liz mentioned, uh, AJC is uh, manning the barricades in terms of uh, defending the Jewish people, both domestically and internationally. And uh, among our many achievements over the years is that uh, we've always believed that a strong Jewish community depends upon a society that is willing to welcome Jews, is hospitable to Jews, and ally with Jews as, as when necessary. We've taken that message not only inside America, where it's worked incredibly well, no society in diaspora Jewish history has been as receptive to Jewish participation as has the United States. But surprisingly, we've also carried that message way beyond the boundaries of, of North America. And in that respect, we really have become a global Jewish advocate, I think, of the first order. I've been with AJC now for some 35 years. Never have I seen it in such a well-positioned um, posture in terms of focusing its agenda on the collective welfare of the Jewish people. And perhaps you can talk about that also in the question and answer period a bit later on. Uh, next week, Jews the world over, talk about being a global agency. Jew next week, Jews the world over will be celebrating Hanukkah. One of the little known aspects of Hanukkah uh, is a statement of the Book of the Maccabees. Uh, Judah the Maccabee and his brothers lived approximately the year 160, 165 before the Common Era. The statement of the Book of the Maccabees reads as follows. During the height of their rebellion against the Syrian Greeks, statements as follows. Judah had heard of the Romans. He sent a delegation to Rome, inviting their participation, their alliance, their friendship. The Romans, in turn, did send a delegation. They told the Syrian Greeks that they favor Jewish independence. In other words, Roman intervention was one factor in what could be called the second Jewish commonwealth, creation of the Maccabean state. It's a bit surprising because we always think of Rome as that Rome destroyed the Jewish state. You know, they burned the temple. Uh, they destroyed the, uh, uh, the, the, the vassal state of the Jews back in the first century, around the year 70. The initial contact between Jews and Rome was hardly one of hostility. It was rather Jewish leadership, Jew, Judah the Maccabee, like the American Jewish Committee, turned at that time to the leading superpower and said, we have commonality of interests. You don't like the Syrian Greeks, and we don't like the Syrian Greeks. Can we work together? A strong Jewish state that is independent essentially will be, will be an ally of Rome in the Middle East. It lasted for about 100 years, 120 years to be exact. Pretty long time. And uh, it's a memory, a historical memory, if you will, that's worth recalling at a time when we often think of the state of Israel today as being beleaguered, besieged, and isolated. Israel has no stronger friend than the United States. My questions this evening are threefold. Number one, how did this special relationship between the United States and Israel develop? Number two, is the special relationship in danger today? In other words, is it undergoing tensions that may undermine it? And three, what's ahead for us? To what extent can we look towards what's down the pike? In other words, in the first part of this talk, I'd like to ask you to be historians and uh, raise the question of how did things come to be between America and Israel? In the second part, I'd like to take a look at the contemporary situation, be political scientists and say, where are we in terms of the special relationship? And in the third part, uh, the most hazardous part, Yogi Berra put it very eloquently, Predictions are very difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> Talmud put it a bit more delicately. They said, since the days of the destruction of the Second Temple, the gift of prophecy has been given over to knaves and fools. I hope I'm not a knave, although I, at times we'll, feel, we'll, we'll plead guilty about being foolish. And in, in that sense, uh, the third part of this talk will be somewhat risky, but I think we do need to look ahead and say, what's ahead in terms of the U.S.-Israel relationship? The relationship historically has rested upon four pillars, none of which can be taken for granted. Number one, that Israel and the United States serve as fellow democracies, commonality of interests, commonality of values. Two, what is oftentimes either taken for granted or glossed over by American Jewry is that America is a fundamentally Christian society. Oh, that's pretty obvious. A religious America tends to be very supportive of a state of Israel. 
In other words, America's religious base wants to see a strong Israel. I say at times we either take it for granted or we gloss over it because at times American Jewry, the most secular group within America, is uncomfortable with expressions of religiosity coming within other faiths. We oftentimes get a little paranoid and say they want to convert us. Christian support for Israel is very real. Again, it should not be taken for granted, but it's a second pillar in the U.S.-Israel relationship. The extent that America is a heavily majority Christian society, that's a major pillar of support for the state of Israel. Three, since the, since the earliest days of the state of Israel, 1948, down to 2015, American Israel have been facing common foes. Whether it was the Soviet Union during the Cold War, 1948 to 1991, or the specter of Islamic terrorism given after the, in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union, American Israel have been closely aligned in terms of having common enemies, common foes. But fourth, and perhaps of greatest relevance to us because it's what we have the greatest input over, a fourth pillar is that American Jewry as a minority community is strong, vibrant, assertive in saying we want the United States and Israel to be as closely aligned as possible. In other words, a weaker American Jewry means diminished American support for Israel. Uh, it's in this context, if you have these four pillars, how did the relationship come to be then? Uh, the special relationship essentially is a post-Kennedy, post-LBJ phenomenon. Relations between America and Israel pre-Kennedy are much more ambivalent. In 1948, the United States State Department, led by General Marshall, one of the most legendary of Americans, George Kennan, who headed up its policy planning staff, they actually opposed American recognition of Israel as an independent state. Marshall argued, you know what will happen if Israel comes into being? Uh, number one is that there'll be war. Number two, it will deprive us of oil supplies. Number three, there will be endless American involvement in a Middle Eastern conflict that is unsolvable. In other words, it will get us into a quagmire that we can't get out of. Truman, to his great credit, and again, one should never, um, we should never underestimate the importance of morality in politics. We tend to think there's no such thing as morality and that governments only do what is in government's interests. Truman never refuted Marshall's argument. On the contrary, he was deeply threatened by Marshall because Marshall said point blank, if America recognizes Israel, I will resign as Secretary of State and I may or may not vote for the president when it comes time for re-election in November of 1948. So Truman was paying a very heavy political price but he said the moral imperative is that America must recognize Israel. It's the right thing to do, and therefore we should do it. The importance of this part of the history is that it creates the dichotomy that has been fairly constant in American political history of the executive arm, the elected arm, the legislature, the Congress, and the presidency, the White House, tend to be supportive of the state of Israel in direct reflection of American public opinion as being supportive of Israel. The specialists in the State Department, the bureaucrats, if you will, the Arabists, they tend to be much more cool when it comes time to the special relationship between America and Israel. This was brought home to Beer very sharply during the Eisenhower years. Secretary of State Dulles said unequivocally, American foreign policy will not be guided, will not be dictated by a Jewish minority. And in that respect, Eisenhower's policy, certainly during the 1956 Suez War, Eisenhower was appalled that Israel, Britain, and France went to war against Nasser. That the whole line of America during the Cold War is that we do not support imperialism. That's something the Soviets do. At that moment, the Soviets were marching into Hungary. It was imperialism par excellence. The American line was that the Soviets do that. We're the good people. We're the gentlemen. We're the, we're the, we're the Boy Scouts. We do not conquer others. But here, as close as allies, we're essentially reenacting the act of imperial, imperialism by, going, by, by trying to take over the Suez Canal. Israel was part of that, and Eisenhower was very bitter about it. Thankfully, during the second Eisenhower term, Israel and the United States more or less came back to being on the same page. 
The 56 war was a very difficult page. It meant the US and Israel were hardly closely aligned. You couldn't speak of a special relationship. What you could speak of was a relationship that had torn asunder. And in Eisenhower's second term, the relationship gradually came back together again. The special relationship itself really emanates from the Kennedy years. Kennedy was the first president to sell arms to Israel. Um, he did so for several reasons. Number one is that he was fearful of an Israeli nuclear weapon. And what he really wanted to do was to divert Israelis from Dimona, which was seen as being a center for nuclear research, by saying America will be supplying arms. Two, Kennedy had learned that uh, uh, Nasser in Egypt was a very unreliable ally. If anything, a very, uh, a very tawdry ally in a lot of ways. Certainly unreliable, certainly not the nice person you want to go to bed with. If anything, one of the things that came through was that NASA was involved in war with Yemen. There were all sorts of reports of poison gas being used in Yemen. So for Kennedy, alliance with Yemen, alliance with NASA um, in terms of Yemen was something that violated his own principles, his own, his own values. Israel, by contrast, seemed again a liberal state, a common democracy, fighting common foes. But the real special relationship emanates from the 67 war during the Johnson years. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, after some stumbling at the beginning, urging Israel not to fire the first shot, his argument was Israel will not be alone unless it chooses to go it alone. But after that, Johnson very quickly moved into a position of unequivocal support for Israel. Part of it were the Jews in Johnson's corner, the eight fortresses, the Walt and Eugene Rostows, the Abe Goldbergs. Um, essentially, they were saying that the Soviets support the, the Arabs, America should be supporting the Israelis. Um, there's no question that American policy, and this is the important thing to realize here, American policy during the 67 war was make sure that Israel attains a complete victory. Uh, the ceasefire resolution in the United Nations was delayed until Israel had accomplished its military aims of conquering the Sinai Peninsula and the, Go and the Golan Heights. America deliberately delayed that ceasefire resolution precisely to enable an Israeli victory. The problem with this is that um, it did not result in any kind of peace between Israel and the Arab states. People thought that uh, the 67 war would demonstrate to the Arab world that Israel was here to stay, and the next step would be sign a peace treaty. Moshe Dayan's famous comment of, I'm waiting for a phone call. It never came. On the contrary, summer of 1968, one year later, was the famous Khartoum resolution of all the Arab states, no negotiations, no compromise, no peace. And that was the three no's of Khartoum. In that context, people began questioning, was the 67 posture of grant Israel its complete victory, while that obviously satisfied American Jewry, was that really wise in terms of the future of Middle Eastern relations? So in 1973, the Kissinger view, again, interestingly articulated by a Jewish State Department uh, leader, Jewish Secretary of State, the Kissinger view was very different. Don't grant the Israelis a victory. That has not led to peace. Ensure that Israel has enough to defend itself, that it maintains its integrity, but aim for a stalemate rather than a victory. The implication, not the implication, the stated, the stated objective was let the Arabs feel that they accomplished something rather than, the, than undergo the humiliation of 67 again. The Kissinger view was basically that of let's do enough to make sure that both sides can walk away from the, from the ceasefire with a sense of we held our own. Kissinger's long-range view was uh, essentially detach Egypt from the Soviet Union, pave the ground for Israel-Egyptian negotiations, and after Kissinger left office, it resulted in the, in the peace treaty of 1979 between Israel and Egypt that broke the, broke the taboo on Arab recognition of the state of Israel. That was the Kissinger view, not an Israeli victory, but rather America should be ensuring a stalemate so as to pave the ground for future peace negotiations. Uh, Kissinger, without question, um, uh, was successful, at least in terms of the Sinai disengagement agreements, 
which laid the groundwork for a comprehensive peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, signed in 1979, remains binding today in 2015. This was at the time a lot of Jewish resentment against Kissinger because unlike Goldberg and unlike his predecessors, he was not being unequivocally supportive of Israel. But any kind of assessment has to ask the question of what did he actually accomplish? Um, perhaps seen from a purely moral perspective, yes, lives were lost because the Yom Kippur War lasted longer than it might have by Kissinger acting the way he did in terms of ensuring a stalemate. In terms of long-range diplomacy, he created a framework by which Israel and Egypt could come together. I don't think that could be taken away from him. The, uh, the years of Ronald Reagan were probably the high tide of the US-Israel special relationship. <coughs> Reagan made it very clear that supporting Israel was a moral imperative, even as he disagreed with different aspects of Israeli policy. He was, at one time he was opposed, not one time, at the time he was opposed to Israel's attack on the Ira Iraqi nuclear reactor, the so-called Osirak reactor in Iraq. Reagan criticized that badly, severely. He was very opposed to uh, the Lebanon War of 1982. In other words, there were moments in U.S.-Israel relations that were rocky moments. But the overall trajectory is that Reagan marked a sharp tilt in Israel's direction, certainly in direct contrast to the previous Carter years, where Carter was seen as being distinctly unfriendly to a state of Israel. During the Clinton years, 1990s, the main, um, the main spokesman or the main uh, diplomat in terms of the Middle East was uh, De Ambassador Dennis Ross, <coughs> who's written up uh, this period in his most recent book called Doomed to Succeed. I have a little problem with the title, but it's in many ways a very compelling analysis of the history of the special relationship. Ross, <coughs> sorry, Ross during, during his tenure came under great criticism for essentially acting as Israel's advocate during the Oslo peace negotiations. Now, was Oslo, uh, Ross was seen as being ineffective, as being too close to Israel. Clearly, the perspective of his bosses, Clinton and Al Gore, was that, yes, peace is necessary, but peace should not be attained by antagonizing the Israelis or the American Jewish community. Um, this, this obviously represented the, uh, the view in Washington during the Oslo years. Oslo was a failure. Ross said explicitly in his earlier book, The Missing Peace, why did Oslo fail? Because Arafat didn't want to sign the deal. Because Arafat walked away from it, he ultimately did not want to create a Palestinian state, even when it was within his, own, within his grasp. In the Bush years, the second Bush, 2000 and 2008, the tilt towards Israel was even sh more sharp. It was even, it was even clearer. Bush, for one thing, distrusted Arafat. Now, was, he learned Clinton's lesson that Arafat simply wouldn't sign, wouldn't sign the agreement. <coughs> but perhaps, sorry, perhaps even more, um, uh, an even more sharp expression of this was the discovery of the so-called Karin A uh, ship in the, in, the, um, in the Gulf of Aqaba. Uh, the Karin A was a ship bringing massive quantities of arms to the Palestinian Authority. Why did they need it? To what end? It was against the terms of Oslo, plus the fact Arafat said, I had nothing to do with it. And that was, he initially denied it completely, then the evidence was, was caught. He was, he was caught red-handed on it. Bush learned from that that essentially, between Israel and Arafat, he was much closer to Israel than he ever would be with the Palestinian Authority. So that during the Bush years, there was an unequivocal uh, tilting towards Israel on the part of Washington. That was a special relationship, if you will, par excellence. But what's happened in the last eight years? Uh, President Obama, on taking office, very early on in 2009, issued his famous Cairo speech. Obama worked with several, several premises that America's image in the, in the Muslim world <coughs> was completely negative because of the Bush years. So part of Cairo was outreach to the Muslim world. Two, that Middle East peace had not profited by a hands-off attitude towards Israel. That it requires much greater American intervention 
than Bush had been willing to do in the previous eight years. So Obama, on the one hand, wanted to reach out to the Muslim world. On the other hand, he, want, he essentially departed from his predecessor in saying the tilt towards Israel may have gratified American Jewry, but was not going to advance Middle East peace. <coughs> Thirdly, in complete fairness to Obama, even when he was running for office and saying he was a great friend of Israel, he said in the same breath that being a supporter of Israel, being a friend of Israel, does not mean embracing the politics of the Likud party. So in that respect, Obama was being very consistent. Uh, Israelis criticized him actually on a fourth ground. No thanks, no. Uh, they criticized him on a fourth ground, <coughs> which is his justification for Jewish state. That in Cairo, he said, of course there has to be a Jewish state because we remember the Holocaust. And then as soon as he left Cairo, he went to one of the concentration camps. Israelis were appalled by this because there was no recognition that the reason for a Jewish state was not the Holocaust. The reason for a Jewish state was realization of Jewish aspirations of 2,000 years. To be fair to, again to Obama, he was articulating a message that many American Jewish leaders had been saying for years. Now, it's American Jewish leaders, including, <laughs> including many, many of the ones that I work so closely with, uh, had been saying for a good many years that um, Israel is necessary because a refuge for Jews, the world is dangerous, anti-Semitism is alive and well, we remember the Holocaust. In other words, the Jews need safe space. We had, as Jewish leaders, we had not been sufficiently outspoken in a somewhat different direction of saying, why does the world need a state of Israel? Because the Jews want to demonstrate what they can do with the Jewish state. Because the Jews have the rights of self-determination of other peoples. And that given the opportunity, the Jews would create an, uh, a state in the Middle East that would, that would be a source of pride for Jews the world over. It was these other tropes, these other notes of why does, why the need, why does there need to be in Israel, not only because of the Holocaust, but because the Jews have actually something to teach in terms of creating a society in terms of creating a, what is the meaning of a, a Jewish democracy. So Jewish leaders had not been out sufficiently outspoken in that direction. And frankly, Obama essentially was almost parroting things that he had heard uh, from so many other Jewish leaders during the time that he'd been campaigning. That said, the, the narrative that he was articulating, that you need a Jewish state because of the Holocaust, it was received very negatively by the Israeli body politic, by the Israeli public. Secondly, um, Obama had, and uh, I can't say yet whether he's passed it or not, but um, certainly he had a problem using the word, the T word, terrorism. He referred to things like violent extremism um, rather than terror. Uh, the implications of this were profound, that Israel was arguing that it is up against a, an entity such as Hamas that does not want to see a Jewish state in any shape, manner, or form. And if anything, you look at the Hamas covenant, which anyone seriously interested in, in the politics of the Middle East cannot ignore. The Hamas covenant says in clear, unequivocal terms, negotiations with the, with the Israeli, the Zionist entity is forbidden in principle. Kill the Jews wherever you can find them. It's one of the most anti-Semitic documents of the 20th century. It's for these reasons that Obama's phraseology of violent extremism, look, every group is going to have its hotheads. You know, we all know that. There's enough violent extremists that are, that are going around. And obviously, they're dangerous people. But they don't represent the kind of political threat that Hamas represents to Israel's existence as a, Jew as a Jewish state. So the issues with Obama uh, is that he seemed to be backing away from uh, the special relationship, either on the grounds that would have been unproductive his criticism of Bush that did not advance the peace process, or his overall view that America needs to have greater outreach to the Muslim world. So where are we then today? And um, what are our concerns? There are reservoirs of strength in terms of the special relationship. Uh, it's been tested, and to some extent, it has withstood the test of time. I want to offer you a couple of examples. Ten years ago, 2006, American Jewish leaders, again, AJC included, 
were deeply concerned about a book by two very prominent professors, Stephen Waltz of the University of, of, of Harvard and John Mearsheimer of, of University of Chicago. The book is called the Israel, the Israel Lobby. Its argument was that American Jewry had hijacked American foreign policy, not to serve America's ends, but to serve Israel's ends. Jewish leaders read this and we said this may be very well be, myself included for the record, this may very well be the end of the special relationship. Because Walter Mearsheimer were arguing not on the basis of moral principle, they were arguing realistically America loses more by the special relationship with Israel than it would gain by not having a special relationship. Reality is, is that 10 years later, I won't say the book has had no traction. Uh, if anything, uh, <coughs> Mr. Walt and Mr. Mearsheimer's uh, lecture fees have skyrocketed considerably, I'm told. Uh, they certainly have done very well with it. However, their book has not been influential in terms of the policy making. Security uh, concerns, uh, security ties between the United States and Israel remain very strong, some would argue even unprecedentedly strong. In other words, that whatever issues one may have uh, about uh, the conduct of politics and the tone of relations between the United States and Israel, the degree of security cooperation is greater today than probably at any moment in the U.S.-Israel relationship. The Walt Mearsheimer argument has fallen, I won't say it's fallen on deaf ears, because they've gotten a hearing not on the, surf, not on the senior, most senior levels, but perhaps more on the more junior levels, the people coming up inside the bureaucracies. But certainly they've not been, they've not been accepted as points of policy. I think there's a second reason for that, and it relates to the second major pillar, namely that America is fundamentally pro-Israel uh, in terms of its public opinion. And that relates, of course, obviously to the issue of what I call America is a majority Christian society. Let me give you one piece of data here. 97% of the pro-Israel support in this country comes from Gentiles, not from Jews. In other words, Jews are maybe 2% of the population. Even if we had 100% of the Jewish community supporting Israel, which we don't, which is another matter entirely, but even if we had 100%, that would account for essentially 3% of the pro-Israel support. Where is the other 97% coming from? It's coming from a Gentile America that is extremely supportive of a state of Israel. Will that continue? I think there are concerns about it, and I want to get to them. But bear in mind that 97% of the population cannot be hijacked by a tiny minority. In other words, the Walt Mearsheimer argument is that the Jews have hijacked American foreign policy. Well, that means that 97% of the pro-Israel support coming from Gentile sources either don't know how to think for themselves, they've been hijacked by this incredible minority, or better yet, have come to their own conclusions that American support for Israel is desirable. I emphasize this point because I think American Jews often fall into a trap of saying the world is against us. Uh, remember Judah the Maccabees appeal to the Romans. Not exactly the most natural allies for the Jews, but he found an alliance there. American Jews have found that America is strongly pro-Israel and wants America to be supportive of Israel. Now, that's the good news, if you will. There is another side to it, and here's where my concerns come into play. In April of this year, roughly speaking eight months ago, Gallup issued a poll. I, uh, I share it with you, but it's, um, again, you should not take it as definitive. Polls in general tend to be soft. They switch from week to week. And basically anyone who answers a question, no matter how informed or uninformed about the issue, he's entitled or she's entitled to his opinion. Um, so, again, I, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily draw conclusions based on a poll, but I would say the poll is worth at least raising our eyebrows and being somewhat concerned. Gallup asked the question, if you were persuaded <coughs> that it was not in America's interest to support Israel, would you still advocate American support for Israel? Among Republicans, by a two to one margin, the answer was yes. In other words, the support for Israel is morally correct and therefore it should be done. Among Democrats, it was just the opposite. You know, one third saying, yes, America should support Israel under those circumstances, two thirds saying no. Again, I don't think this poll is definitive. I think it's one snapshot in time and it's April. Things, a lot of, a lot of, April, of course, is the period of uh, Obama's, um, not Obama, Netanyahu's visit to Congress, which uh, elicits strong reactions here. 
So again, it's a poll that measures one, one particular window, but the implication of it is something worth pondering. Go back to my history of the special relationship. It was there under Kennedy. It was there under Johnson. It was there under Reagan. It was there under Clinton, under Bush. The message is one of bipartisanship. In other words, both major parties committed to a strong U.S.-Israel relationship. When the relationship is no longer bipartisan, by definition, it should be, it should be a, a point of concern for us. It doesn't mean the relationship is finished, but it does mean there are shaky grounds here. It does mean there are grounds for concern. I think there's a second, um, two other grounds for concern. Uh, I mentioned that the Christian support for Israel is very strong. The numbers of Christians in this country are going down. Um, America, eight years ago, was 78% Christian. Obviously, many different denominations, but 78% Christian. Today, it's only 72%. Now, six percentage points may not be all that much, although it represents a loss of almost 10%. But it suggests that as America becomes more secular, that support for Israel may very well decline. In other words, a more religious America has been strongly supportive of Israel. A less religious America Again, grounds for concern. And thirdly, um, what should be on the minds of all American Jews is that we face a real problem of assimilation. Uh, once again, uh, one goes back to the Pew Report of 2013. The most important element coming out of the Pew, of the Pew Report was the rise of the so-called nuns. Not N-U-N-S, not the religious nuns, but the N-O-N-E-S, no religion at all. Um, to the extent that American Jews are less concerned with Judaism, they're going to be less concerned with Israel. Now recall the fourth pillar. The US, the special relationship presupposes a strong, vibrant, assertive American Jewry that wants to see the United States and Israel closely aligned. You weaken that attachment, you weaken the, that strong, assertive American Jewry, and you have a Jewish community that is less concerned with being Jewish by definition, that fourth pillar of a strong, a strong Jewish minority advocating stronger U.S.-Israel ties becomes increasingly in danger. So therefore, where are we? And better yet, where are we going? And here, as I say, the most tenuous part of my talk, namely, to what extent are predictions possible about the future? Let me offer a couple of uh, concerns, at least, about where, where history is currently heading. We were talking earlier, it's on the minds, I think, of everyone. Uh, what about the college campus? Um, there are two reasons for concern about the college campus. Number one is that um, the college campus is the most secular of American institutions. One of the reasons Jews have embraced the college campus is that it's the road to upward mobility. It's the place where it doesn't make too much of a difference whether you're Jew, Christian, Muslim, or whatever. In other words, it's neutral space. Um, and it's been the road for American upward mobility. College campus is, um, uh, if you look at pro-Israel support in this country, overwhelmingly Americans support Israel. Uh, the, here the polls have been very consistent since 1948. Americans support Israel by four, four to one, five to one margins over the Palestinians, but not on the college campuses. Any polls on the college campus suggest either even-handedness, you know, roughly speaking a 50-50 split, or at best, a three to two pro-Israel majority. Oftentimes, by the way, it's uh, simply a matter of indifference. Uh, college students are less concerned with foreign policy than they are with their own internal lives, their domestic concerns. Um, but the college campus as a whole uh, has not been a reservoir of pro-Israel support. Where's that going in the future? This has been the case for a while. It has not resulted in affecting the overall poll numbers. The cynical side of me says it suggests college professors aren't teaching very much these days. Um, the other side of me says I would be concerned because they're certainly teaching the most intellectual elements on campus. Here's where I think we're really, is the second grounds for concern about it. Namely, I'm not one who becomes paranoid about the BDS movement. No university has supported BDS, and I can't see that happening anytime soon, if at all. What I see happening is that as the BDS movement gets more momentum, it contributes to the anti-Israel negativity on college campuses. People who go particularly to elite influential universities, whether it's Harvard on the East Coast, Berkeley on the West Coast, and a ton of places in between, those who go to the elite universities 
are the ones most likely to enter into positions of influence in American public life. If the education they're receiving in their early 20s is one with, that does not favor or be hospitable to a special U.S.-Israel relationship, well, what do you think they're going to say when they actually enter into public life 10, 15, 20 years down the road? So in that respect, the college campus, American Jews look at this, and we get, we get our, our backs up on the college campus, the sense of it's become unsafe for Jews. No, that's an extreme statement. No institution in American society has been as open as receptive to Jewish involvement as has the college campus. Back in the 1960s, I, I was at Columbia, more radical student um, uh, was in class with me, and he got up and he said, of course there's anti-Semitism on campuses. No Ivy League university has had a college president. Well, today, uh, 50 years later, with one exception, no Ivy League university has not had a Jewish president. Um, in other words, Jews are incredibly influential in terms of the campuses. We're 2% of the population. We're 5% of the student population. We're 10% of the faculties. We're 20% of elite faculties. Uh, a university like Columbia, where I went, roughly speaking, is about 25% Jewish. So to think that the, the campus has become unsafe for Jews, I, I find that very unfair to what's actually happening on the campus. And frankly, again, I've, I've gotten emails from uh, AJC people, non-AJC people, saying um, uh, I won't send my child to an anti-Semitic Columbia, uh, which, again, I find personally problematical because I'm an alumnus, and I never saw it. I, mean, I saw it on the contrary as being quite, being quite hospitable. That's not to say that, there are no, that everyone at Columbia is a great friend of the Jewish people or a great friend of Israel, not by a long shot. But it's unfair to draw the conclusion that the campus has become unsafe for Jews. I think a conclusion that is much more moderate, but at the same time deeply disturbing, is what is the future of the U.S.-Israel special relationship when the education on campus today is tilting away from friendship or support for the state of Israel? So that's one modest prediction, and again, that's one I hope I'm wrong, but certainly I see the direction heading in that way. Two, I would also be concerned about so-called bipartisanship. The extent that we maintain a bipartisan consensus supporting Israel, we have strong grounds for thinking the special relationship will continue. But to the extent that Israel becomes a conservative or Republican cause, and not a liberal and democratic cause, we destroy bipartisanship, we make it into a partisan cause, and again, it's going to become, it's, it's going to become a weaker relationship um, between Washington and Jerusalem because it no longer will reflect that bipartisan consensus. Again, at times we, uh, we don't take the long view here. We at times become attracted in one form or another to who's going to give the strongest pro-Israel speech. Every candidate will line up to give that pro strong pro-Israel speech. But you've got to ask the question of, can Israel maintain its support within both major parties? And here is a real challenge to American Jewry. American Jewish involvement on both sides of the aisle in a distinctively nonpartisan rather than partisan basis, which is at the core of what AJC has defined itself. That is essential to securing the future U.S.-Israel relationship. Thirdly, I think Dennis Ross has offered some very uh, important insights in his recent book that have not been fully weighed. Ross has two major conclusions, which are, again, something that I would hope American policymakers would take very seriously. Ross argues that since 1973, America has never paid a serious price for supporting Israel in terms of loss of support within the Arab world. Now, as the George Marshalls of, this, of, of America were wrong, that outside of the Arab oil boycott of 73, since then, America has not paid a heavy price for supporting Israel. Conversely, Ross argues, America's earned very few brownie points for supporting the Arab world. In other words, the hope that Arabs would move closer to, the, to, to U.S. policy has also not materialized. Ross stands in that respect as someone advocating a strong U.S.-Israel special relationship. I think that insight is critical. It's not fully appreciated in the policy, in the policy sectors. Uh, America has not paid a heavy price for supporting Israel, nor has America gained very much by not supporting Israel, by tilting away from Israel. Again, will that play into policy? That remains to be seen, but it certainly is a new argument that has not been made effectively before. Um, but fourthly, and this perhaps is, is, my, is my conclusion, is that um, the tide of assimilation is probably our single greatest problem 
in terms of the U.S.-Israel relationship. As Jews become less committed to leading a Jewish life, it's going to become more and more difficult to marshal the energies of American Jewry behind a special U.S.-Israel relationship. Frankly, here again is a real challenge to Jewish leadership. We're extremely good at combating our foes and challenges when they come from outside the room. When they're coming from the outside world, we're extremely good at creating a wall-to-wall -wall coalition, if you will, of Jews for Judaism. But when the problem is internal, when it's the issue of erosion of Jewish identity, we suddenly become much less sure-footed, much less confident in asserting our own Jewish identity. I put it in Newsweek magazine a number of years ago when there was still a Newsweek. I understand it's gone, undergone some sort of renaissance, but I let my subscription lapse a long time ago. But uh, I put it there in an article a number of years ago. I said, the very same Jewish leaders who are so self-confident in terms of marching down to Washington and telling the State Department what its policy should be towards Israel in the privacy of their own homes can't find the language of explaining to their children why leading a Jewish life might be important. In that sense, our internal challenge of can we make Jewish life worthwhile living and transmitting to the next generation is one that we have not me measured up to. One small illustration, and again, it's something we've been discussing at AJC in the last few months. The Pew Report was released in 2013. Amazingly, business as usual in the Jewish community. In other words, yes, we hear the Pew Report, we know assimilation is a problem, but we have other things to worry about. Let's, let's focus on the Iranian nuclear bomb. We know that we can deal with. Assimilation, much more problematical. What does the amount to with this? I'll, I'll close. Um, I'm not one who becomes hysterical about the U.S.-Israel relationship. It has weathered many ups and downs over the last 65 years. And the overall trajectory has been, it's never been a straight line, but the overall trajectory has been continued strong U.S. support for Israel. It's rested on those four pillars. Of those four pillars, at least two are at risk. Number one, a Christian, a strong Christian population that wants to see Israel and the United States closely aligned. And two, a strong American Jewish community that's prepared to advocate that continued relationship. You lose two pillars, or two pillars become weakened, the entire, the entire enterprise is in danger. We should be concerned without being hysterical. Thank you. Okay, Herb, uh, Herb's question is really twofold. To what extent has bipartisanship been, been endangered by the Prime Minister himself, by his open support for Romney in the 2012 election, and by his appearance for Congress uh, in April of uh, 2015? Um, as far as the first is concerned, Herb, bear in mind, um, look, I, I dislike the idea of Israeli Prime Ministers interfering in American electoral politics, but it's hardly unprecedented. Uh, ambassador Rabin, when he was ambassador, Rabin is an iconic figure. I mean, bear, bear that in mind. But in 1972, he said Jews should be voting for Nixon. Uh, he, was, he was patted on the wrist for it. You know, he, didn't, he didn't, wasn't exactly endear himself to American Jewry, but he did do it, and he was not the only one. So in that respect, Israeli intervention, uncalled for and not, not helpful, uh, has not been a primary cause for dim diminished bipartisanship. The issue of the appearance for Congress, I'd, I'd say, was more problematical. Um, look, uh, again, we're, we're eight months, ten months past it, eight months past it. The American Jewish Committee sent a delegation to, uh, to Jerusalem, and we met privately with the Prime Minister, and we said point blank, it is not a good idea, for the reasons you, you allude to. I wish the Prime Minister had accepted that advice. I still stand by it. Uh, we made our point. We made it with dignity and not in, a, not, in a, not in a way that would be seen as being hostile to Israel or hostile to the Prime Minister. But we said with our reading of American society and, our, and American politics, such a, um, such a visit for the Congress um, would exacerbate the partisanship and diminish the bipartisanship. The Prime Minister reached his own conclusions. Um, uh, probably what was motivating him was the sense of urgency regarding the Iran deal. Um, which he was unequivocally opposed to, and always said he was. Um, he has a legitimate point of view. We had, we had a legitimate point of view. I wish he'd accepted ours. Maybe the history would have been different in the last 10 months had he, had he accepted ours. But we did make the point. And therefore, I can't disagree with you in terms of your, uh, your reading of it. 
Uh, I would only caution here that um, diminished bipartisanship results from mul multiple factors. It doesn't result from one single incident, as unfortunate as that may have been. Okay, I want to come back to that. That's the first part. Does Israel's religious policies affect the relationship? The second part of your question about what about policies in terms of West Bank settlements? The second part is far more controversial, but I would suggest not nearly as um, existential, of existential significance as one might think. Look, most settlement construction today, if not all settlement construction, takes place within areas that will be part of Israel regardless. In other words, that we know what a, what a peace agreement would look like. It essentially would, if and when it ever comes to pass, and I'm, actually I'm quite skeptical about seeing it anytime soon, um, and I hope I'm wrong about that, but um, uh, if and when a peace agreement comes to pass, what both sides have more or less acknowledged is that there need to be land swaps. What does the land swaps mean? Areas of Jewish settlement on the West Bank will become absorbed into a state of Israel in exchange for land swaps going the other way into a state of Palestine. There will be some, there will be problematics, probably about uh, 110,000 Israeli settlers who are not living in the settlement blocks, but are living on the West Bank. They're, that's going to be a major issue. So the settlements are a problem. The question is whether they're an existential problem. Now here I would caution you in a number of directions. Number one is that um, uh, peace negotiations during the Oslo years continued, even as settlement construction continued as well. In other words, it wasn't the settlements that prevented Oslo. What prevented Oslo was ultimately Arafat walked away from it at Camp David in the year 2000. Number two, um, the Prime Minister, we said some things about his policies uh, eight months ago, it should not be forgotten that five, six years ago, he's the one, the only Prime Minister who declared a moratorium on settlements. In other words, in order to spur negotiations, he said there will be a moratorium on constructing settlements. The uh, Palestinian Authority, then under Mohammed Abbas, waited till month 10 before any negotiations took place when the, the moratorium had three weeks to go. In other words, nothing became of the offer to create a moratorium, and, and no, no peace negotiations ensued. My own sense for what it's worth, and uh, I think by and large AJC would, would agree with me here, uh, is that um, yes, the settlements are a problem, but they're not the problem. Um, in other words, that um, there are issues, particularly in terms of, say, the hilltop settlements, which are illegal and really should be removed. There are other settlements that are not hilltop or illegal, but they're so deep inside the West Bank that they're not part of the, of the settlement blocks that are adjacent to the, to the Green Line, the 1948 armistice lines, and Jews living in those, in those settlements, that will be a real issue, and there's about 100,000 of them, so the settlements are a problem. But if you're looking at the current policies, Right now, without declaring a freeze on settlement construction, any, I can't say all, but I, I certainly think the overwhelming majority of settlement construction right now is taking place in terms of settlements that will stay part of the state of Israel as part of these land swaps. So in that sense, I don't think it's the ultimate problem. What does need to be confronted is that um, if and when a two-state solution materializes, both sides are going to be making some very difficult compromises. And in that respect, uh, yes, the 100,000 100, 100, Jews who are not living in the settlement blocks, but are living on the West Bank, they will be a major force that will have to be contended with. And uh, I, I'd be quite concerned about that. So I think that your, the issues you raised there, are the settlements uh, a problem in terms of uh, uh, support for Israel? Um, I think they're a problem, they're not the problem. That's the best answer I can give you. Your other question about what about Israel's religious policies, again, I'll go back to my earlier talk. On two grounds, I'd say yes, Those, that's a real problem. Number one is that um, one pillar of the U.S.-Israel relationship has been the notion of being fellow democracies, shared values, um, having a Jewish democratic state closely aligned with an American democracy. Um, the absence of religious pluralism is seen as being a, a, a retreat from democratic principles. Now, again, it's not an all or nothing ball game here. Israel is far more pluralistic today, say, than it was 30 years ago, um, or even 20 years ago. The number of reform congregations, the number of conservative congregations has, uh, has, has mushroomed, has grown significantly. The monopoly of the chief rabbinate does continue over issues of personal status. In turn, 
that suggests that Israel does not believe in freedom of choice. And for many people, choice is a byword for democracy. So yes, I'd be very concerned for that. And AJC identified religious pluralism as a primary issue in the US-Israel special relationship. In other words, a national security issue. And we established a wall-to-wall -wall coalition called Jewish Religious Equality Coalition. I was just there on behalf of it last week, together with others here. Um, we're committed to um, trying to break the monopoly of the chief rabbinate, not by abolishing it, but rather by creating alternatives to it. Um, in that respect, American Jews who see that monopoly and see it so sharply at odds with the principle of choice, you know, with this monopoly, there's no choice. Younger American Jews may very well drift away from Israel because they see Israel in forms that are distinctively undemocratic in American Western eyes. So I would be deeply concerned about that. I'm concerned about the settlements as well. I see them as a problem, but again, not an existential problem. Okay, you've raised some very important issues. Let me again try to break it down. The first, the first item was um, this question of weren't there Israeli political leaders that intervened in American elections? Uh, my answer to that is unequivocally yes. Um, one of the, one of the um, most amusing comments of President Clinton when he uh, clearly backed Perez in the 1996 election and Netanyahu won, Clinton's comment in public, you know, when he was asked about this, he says, well, why are you asking questions about questions that can't be explained? You know, in other words, he says, I have no answer for you. Please don't ask me that kind of a question. The only reason I'm not angry about it is I say, look at Clinton's overall record. The overall record was continuing support for Israel. The eight years of Clinton, and again, I'm saying this in a very distinctively nonpartisan sense, I won't tell you whom I voted for. But what I will say, which you can never take away from Clinton, is that the eight years of Clinton marked the collapse of any remaining barriers to Jewish participation. The administration stopped counting how many Jews it employed, and it really didn't care. That is a major achievement that you can't take away from him. The second part of your question is, uh, what about, um, it actually has two parts to it as well. What about Jewish intellectuals and professors who are vigorously anti-Israel? And an offshoot of that is, does that create a climate on campus in which Jewish students feel intimidated? Okay, now again, let me sort of break that down. Um, the, um, the Jewish professoriate, like the professoriate generally, uh, tilts very, very liberal in its politics. And that's why I said, to the extent that the cause of Israel becomes a conservative cause, it's going to become a very difficult cause, especially on campus. Conservative causes don't play well in the liberal, cause, in the liberal environments of university campuses. Now, that's not true of Bible Belt campuses in Alabama, but it's very true of the elite campuses on the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, in that sense, I can't be surprised uh, about the reaction of Jewish professors. Number one, uh, there is the issue of assimilation themselves. Number two, to the extent that Israel is a partisan cause, they're in the wrong party, so to speak. Um, or they see Israel as being as supporting the wrong party. So it must be seen in that, in that context. Um, offended at times, not more than, more than just offended at times, offended much of the time, when I see Jewish professors who are so one-sided in their criticism of Israel, uh, as if it doesn't matter what, uh, what's going on in the Arab world. I had a debate not long ago at the Jewish Theological Seminary, not with a seminary professor to be sure, but a visiting professor from, uh, I believe it was CUNY, where he said, it's American Jewry that's retarding peace. Why? Because we American Jewish leaders don't really want to see peace because when, there, when there's peace, we won't be terribly important. We'll be irrelevant. We want to be relevant, therefore we don't want to see peace. So I said back to him, I said, um, I responded by saying, look, I, I know American Jewish leadership extremely well. I can't think of a single one of them that believes that their own importance is more important than peace and that would retard a, a serious peace process. But what amazes me about your presentation is that you haven't mentioned the word Arab once. In other words, you've said the problem with the peace process is that Jewish leadership doesn't want it. Tell me what's going on in the Arab world. So I'm deeply offended by that one-sidedness. I attribute it to, again, the more liberal ethos on campuses, coupled, in this case, with a very committed Jewish professor. But yes, we have a serious problem of assimilation, and it's particularly accentuated uh, in the campus environment. The second problem you raise is more interesting to me, though, and that is, I've said the real danger with the BDS movement is that it might undermine US support for Israel down the road, that products of 
hip of university education at elite campuses will ultimately enter into positions of influence, and in so doing, they won't look favorably upon a US-Israel special relationship. That was my point, and I think that's true. You're raising a second point. Um, what about campuses which you're not talking about what will happen 10 years down the road, but right now you might feel intimidated as a Jew speaking out on behalf of Israel? I think it's a very legitimate concern. I don't believe we have much data here. We have a great deal of anecdotes, but no one can say with a straight face, this is really the situation on campus. We have a lot of an anecdotal information, but to what, it's not been tested, it's not been empirically uh, measured. I'd, I'd like to know exactly what is the perception uh, of Israel on American college campuses among faculty and students. And then we can get at the question of, does this create a climate of intimidation? Now, there's no question, things have gone wrong on a good number of campuses. That cannot be denied. I don't believe it's normative. There are 4,000 campuses in the country. We've had problems maybe at, maybe at 40, and that may be 40 very important ones. But you're talking, essentially, if my numbers are correct, you're talking about 1%. Um, most university campuses, I believe, are quite hospitable to Jews. But again, I'm speaking anecdotally as well. I'd like to see a serious study on what is the perception of Israel and support for and pro-Israel activism in American university campuses. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.